In recent videos here on Maker's Muse, you might have started noticing the strange flashing lights and knobs, dials and sliders in the background of the shots and wondered just what the heck is all of that? Well, it's my backdrop. What do you think it is? It's just here to make the video look pretty. Yeah, nah, that's not true. This is my music production setup and these are synthesizers. In this video, I'll walk you through some of the history about some of the coolest synths I have in my collection. I'll show you how they work. And most importantly, I'll show you how they sound. Welcome to my wall of sound. And we'll start with this, the Behringer 2600, which is one of my newer synths, but it's actually based on the Korg ARP 2600, released in 1971. Yeah, pretty old, and it's actually a fully analog synthesizer. Now, I'm not gonna go into the details of analog versus digital, but essentially analog synths use discrete components to create the waveforms that create the sound. And this has three separate oscillators, that are used to create those sounds. And this is what's known as a semi-modular synthesizer. Now that's because you can have synthesizers that are just separate modules. Like you have a module that's just the oscillator, a module that's just the envelope generator, and then you plug between them with these huge cables here to get a resulting sound. But because this is semi-modular, it can make sound just on its own, or you can use cables to reroute different signals to change it as you wish. And the 2600 employs what's known as subtractive synthesis. So let me walk you through a quick demo of that. So here we have the 2600 and it has its three analog oscillators and these are oscillating all the time. So for example, I've got oscillator three turned up and if I turn the uh, VCF up, you can just hear it doing its thing. And you can see it's got that very distinctive sawtooth waveform and that's why it's known as a sawtooth waveform and it has that very harsh sound. But because this is subtractive synthesis, what we can do from this point on is we can start cutting away frequencies. Like this, this is a low cutoff. And you can hear and see that it starts rounding off that waveform. Like that. But having a note just drain on like that isn't very interesting, is it? So that's where we employ a envelope generator, which essentially automates what I just did. It will actually make the envelope for that cutoff follow a path. And it's known as an ADSR. It stands for attack, decay, sustain, and release. So if I turn the uh, ADSR up, the envelope generator, so what this will now do is I can set where the note will end up and where it, it will rise to with the ADSR. And then we can start playing around with how it sounds. So that sort of starts high and then comes down. Starts lower and then comes down. Or if we like, we can make it ramp all the way up and then down like this. And just with combinations of this, you can get some really interesting sounds like, you hear like that. And this is just one of the oscillators. If I bring in the other oscillators, out of tune, I can tune that. Nice fifth there. But remember this is a semi-modular synthesizer. So for example, if I don't want a sawtooth wave here, I can plug into a different waveform. For example, I can choose a pulse wave. So I'll just grab that there and then stick it into VCO3 like that. And you can hear that now that's a pulse wave. And I can change the pulse width. make it thinner or wider. I'm not sure why it shows on the scope. It should be a perfect uh, square, but uh, this scope just isn't very good. 
But yeah, that's a very quick and dirty demonstration of how uh, subtractive synthesis works and how the 2600 works with its three uh, analog oscillators. And if you turn them all on, you get some pretty fat sounds indeed. The ARP 2600 was originally intended as a teaching synth for schools and universities, but it has a huge legacy, which is why Behringer's recreated it here, and Korg actually re-released the original ARP 2600 not too long ago, because it just is such an iconic synthesizer, and it's been used by so many different artists and in so many different movies. In fact, the original sound of R2-D2 was made using an ARP 2600 to create those blippy bloppy sounds that it's so well known for uh, with a microphone input that was then dialed and modulated and changed on the fly to create that R2-D2 sound. And it's incredibly powerful, but also incredibly confusing. This is probably the most uh, daunting synth I have in my collection. And it's not so much because there's so many things you can change, but it's the fact that you can't save anything. Everything is as you see it. As soon as you move a dial, you'll never have it exactly how it was before. So you can't save presets, you get a good sound, you enjoy it as it is, and then commit it to memory, or you save a preset by taking a photo of it and remembering kind of where everything was, where your patch cables were, if, they, if you are using patches, and then you can go back to it in future if you want. But yeah, it is a very hands-on synthesizer, lots of fun to play with, but a little bit daunting if you're brand new to synthesis. This is the Roland JX-8P, and it's the first physical synthesizer I ever picked up. I went and drove like two hours to a random guy to pick it up off Gumtree, and I fell in love with it. This is what made me fall in love with physical rack units and synthesizers in general. Because it's so hands-on to create soundscapes, I learned so much about sound and audio generation by playing with this synth that I decided that, yeah, I really did actually enjoy having some physical units to make my music. But the JX-8P is actually special for a number of reasons. It's actually one of the last analog synthesizers that Roland ever made. Uh, they actually ma did make one called the JX-10, which is like a doubled up version of the 8P. But essentially this was competing up against the Yamaha DX-7, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, and Roland was really trying to nail down that sleek aesthetic to compete and make this unit as similar as possible. And that means that they copied some of the, the, in my opinion, crap aesthetic choices, like these awful membrane buttons at the front. But don't let that put you off because the 8P is an absolute analog monster. It has digitally controlled oscillators, which means it's very stable. It survived, you know, till this day being quite well in tune without needing much servicing. But everything else is analog and it has six voices and two oscillators per voice which means it can create some gorgeous luscious pads. Because the thing about Roland is that famous chorus. This synthesizer has the same chorus as the one that became famous on the Juno series, and it sounds absolutely mega. Let me give you a quick demo. The biggest issue with the 8P, again, is the layout. These, these horrible membrane keyboards means programming it is very difficult. Again, going back to the Behringer 2600, all of those dials and sliders and everything make it very easy to program. But this, yeah, what do you do? Well, it actually did come with a programmer, but of course, they're really hard to find and actually usually more expensive than the synthesizer itself. So thankfully, companies like Retroactive make aftermarket programmers 
for the 8P and other synthesizers where you can actually get the sound and then modify it using this bank and then you can save it to the internal presets. But now let's move on to a synthesizer that uses a completely different method of generating sound, the DX7. This is the Yamaha DX7, or in my case, the DX7S, but the original DX7 was released in 1983 and it changed the landscape of synthesizers because it uses an entirely different method of creating sound. The synthesizers I've shown you already use subtractive synthesis where you take a waveform and then remove things from that, that sound, that waveform to create the sound. These synthesizers use FM synthesis, which is frequency modulation. And it is a heck of a lot more confusing and I still don't fully understand it. Essentially you have separate operators, which are sine waves, and then these sine waves are modulated together to create completely different sounds. And the synthesizer combines those six operators in what's known as algorithms, which are essentially flow charts where the different waveforms will come into each other, be modulated and then fed into others to create a massive variety of sounds. Now, the DX7 was well known for very cheesy bell sounds and, and electric piano, but artists like Brian Eno really pushed the boundaries of what the DX7 could do to create these, uh, these otherworldly soundscapes. And to this day, the DX7 and its various incarnations have left a lasting impact on the landscape of the music industry. It was actually the most sold synthesizer of all time. It was the first synth ever to breach 100,000 sold units, which was unheard of in what is otherwise a very niche industry. If you wanna pick up a DX7, then don't pay too much because there is a heck of a lot of them out there. People are asking stupid prices now because of COVID tax. Again, I have a DX7S, which I do prefer. It has a bigger patch bank, a better uh, DAC or digital to audio converter, and it has better buttons at the top. It doesn't have those awful membrane buttons. However, you don't actually need one at all because the software emulations for the DX7 now are so good, like Dext, which is free, that you don't actually need it. But I just love the physical unit. I love playing with the algorithms in real time and changing the different sounds I can get out of it. And just small changes create the most wild alterations in the sound you get out of it. It's really, really fun to play with. And if you're interested in sound generation at all, then I highly recommend just playing with the DX7 for a bit and getting a feel of how FM works. The DX7 is notorious for its difficulty to program because it has just one data slider and then you navigate through the menu through these buttons here, which are the patch buttons. I don't find it too difficult. I have the TX802, which is a rack mount FM synth from Yamaha as well. And that just has like number input that's hard to program. The data slider actually makes it a lot easier to program DX7. However, if you wanted complete control over each of those operators, you might want to check out this quirky instrument, which is called the Mega FM. What I have here is the Mega FM produced by Twisted Electrons in France. And it's such a quirky little unit because even though it's been manufactured recently, it uses vintage Yamaha FM sound chips from the Sega Mega Drive or Sega Genesis. It has two of them in it, and all of the parameters are laid out for you to easily access with all of these sliders right here. Now I mentioned before on the DX7 that FM synthesizers use operators, and then you can modulate those operators into each other using algorithms. Now this is cut down a lot from what the DX7 is capable of. The DX7 has six operators, this has four. But what makes this thing so special is the gritty sound that these chips are capable of producing. The Yamaha YM2612 FM chips are famous for being noisy. Uh, they have this really odd distortion when you play them. I don't quite understand it, but what I do understand is how lovely it sounds. It has a really unique sound and aesthetic to it that I don't really feel is something you could reproduce with a virtual software instrument. It's very much down to the hardware. Even though this is digital, it's like, 
retro digital. It's very strange. And it just has that sound that's reminiscent of those very early video games that had the sound chips built in. So that means the game cartridges essentially had MIDI files that were played into the sound chips on board of the game consoles, which would produce the sound. And that's why emulators don't sound quite right for systems that did this. You really have to have the original sound chips to then make the audio sound proper. So if you really like the sound of this, then definitely keep an eye out because it is a pretty unique instrument. And last but not least is the JP8080. Now this is the rack mount version of the JP8000, which is a monster synth and responsible for essentially spawning the entire trance genre because it was used in almost every track. So the JP8080 and 8000 are analog modeling synthesizers, which means they're digital, but they attempt to replicate subtractive synthesis in analog synthesizers. And it's a very early example of analog modeling, but it's done incredibly well. And it's still to this day holds up as a very, very powerful synthesizer. And the reason it was so popular for the trance genre is because it introduced a new wave type called Super Saw. And what this Super Saw waveform does, is it takes that saw wave, creates many copies of it, and then detunes them all slightly from each other. So this detuning makes the sound very wide and fat. That's why for the trance genre, it was just so powerful and pretty much every producer used A8080 or 8000 to create their tracks. And just to prove to you how influential this synthesizer was for those early electronic genres, there's a preset in here called Sandstorm. So yeah, Daruk clearly had no imagination and just named his song after a preset, but can you really blame him? This thing is incredible for that creative drive to make amazing melodies, and I just play it directly with the keyboard into the MIDI and just have a great time. So there you have it, that is my wall of sound, and I use it all the time for my music production here on the channel and just for my own enjoyment. But there's two other things I do want to touch on. One is additional gear you need to get the sounds and control these synths to the computer. And two, do you need them at all for music production? We'll start with one, to get the audio from the synthesizers into the computer, you need an audio interface. And the issue is with so many different audio sources, you need multiple audio ins into the computer. So you might be familiar with some basic sound cards if you're, you have like a microphone set up, you have the microphone audio in. That's one, but what if you have this many? Well, I use the Roland Studio Capture and it has 16 inputs. Yeah, you can record 16 in simultaneously into your digital audio workspace. I use Cubase, but you can use pretty much anything. So you can have these things being played by MIDI or yourself, and then they can be recorded simultaneously to the computer up to 16 ins. Now 16 may sound like a lot, but it actually gets eaten up really quickly because some of these synths are actually stereo. So that's two, that's a stereo pair. For example, with the JX8P with the chorus, it sounds really good, but only if it's in stereo. If it's in mono, it just doesn't sound right. It doesn't have that, that panning effect you really need. So 16 does get eaten up quite a bit. So I do have a patch bay as well. So some of the lesser used synthesizers, I'll actually patch them in to take up a lane. But generally I record one or two at once using MIDI and then get into the computer. So you might be wondering, what is MIDI and why is it important? Well, MIDI is actually a really, really ancient way of interfacing synthesizers to each other, but it still holds up today. And I use MIDI over USB from my keyboard into the computer and the computer then sends those MIDI signals to my synthesizers and then they produce a sound which goes back into the computer through the audio interface. And the thing about MIDI is you can daisy chain MIDI cables. So you can go into one synthesizer, then out into another, another, another. But that has issues. For a start, you need them all on at once. So if you have one synth off in the chain, then the signal won't pass through. And the other issue is that it creates 
weird latency issues and glitches the further along the line you go down the daisy chain. So that's why I use this. It's the Roland A880 MIDI patcher. And this is again, it's old tech, but this actually lets me put the MIDI cable into it and then it splits it out into separate streams into the synths. And that means they can be on or off. It doesn't matter as long as the A880 is on then I'll get the signal from the computer into the synthesizer that I need at that time. But then finally, last point, do you even need any hardware to make music? Well, no, <laughs> you don't at all. For years, I just used VSTs, which are virtual instruments in the computer uh, door, which is your digital audio workspace. And you can pick up free VSTs. They're not that amazing. I primarily use something called Audio Helix. It's really old now, but it was about 150 bucks and it is stupidly powerful for making all sorts of amazing sounds. Like I was talking about the Supersaw waveform in the JPA-80. Well, in Audio Helix, you can create like several instances of Supersaws. I do really like that VST and I can highly recommend it. But yeah, you can get started with music production pretty much for free. You can use a free door. You don't even need a keyboard, although they are very cheap on eBay Marketplace and Gumtree because a lot of people buy them for their kids and then oh, they don't, oh, I don't want them anymore. Just make sure they are USB MIDI or uh, MIDI cable so you can actually connect them to your interface and then you're good to go because I do highly recommend trying music production if you're at least, at least a little bit creative. Because I find for me, although I'm not an amazing artist, I find it incredibly relaxing to actually just sit down and make some sounds. Especially if I pump up the reverb and then play around with some of these older synths, you can get some really massive soundscapes and just play around and just have fun. I rarely record these, these, these sessions because it's just for me winding down and finding that zen space. So if you're interested in music production at all, then I'll put some links in the description below for some really cool channels to check out, and also some channels who do some really cool vintage gear videos like Espen Craft, for example, who was instrumental in me learning more about the JX-8P, which is before I picked one up. I learned all, everything I could from his videos, so I highly recommend his channel and a few others in the description below. And I know this is different to my normal content, but everyone's been asking, what is that in the background? This is my studio, I do everything in here. And I also make my music production here as well. So I hope I've answered some of those questions. I know a lot of technical jargon in this. I've tried to keep it as simple as possible, but please do leave your comments and questions below. I will endeavor to answer them as much as I can. And I hope you found this video interesting. I look forward to seeing you again very shortly here on Maker's Muse. Catch you later guys, bye.